Alex, and thank you, uh, Ayanna, for the great introduction. Um, and then thanks for now some 90 uh, participants. Uh, thank you for joining this, uh, this session. Um, so the topic for today is exit, um, and I'm very happy that we have some, some great speakers also joining us today. Um, let's move away from a photo of myself to a photo of many more, much more important people. There we go. Um, so we're joined today by three investors, by uh, Joy Mubala, Kate Mazel, and Danai Musandu. Um, a very interesting mix of people, uh, of investors who sort of come in at, at different, at different uh, times, at different moments, if you will. Um, but I think we want to start with a, with a brief introduction or letting the, um, uh, our speakers introduce themselves and then jump right in. And then just sort of as the, um, some rules for the, for the session, um, we have time for a Q&A after the session. But any questions that come up, please just sort of drop them in the, in the chat function. And we'll try to sort of integrate them into the, into the conversation as we go along. Um, or otherwise, we'll give you a chance to, uh, to ask the question also in, at the Q&A session. Um, but, free, but, but we very much want to invite everyone to sort of you know, share your opinion, uh, uh, ask the question, and hopefully make it sort of a, a lively debate, if you will. So without further ado, I would like to invite the, uh, the investor panel to introduce uh, themselves. Um, maybe we start with the ladies first. Um, Joy, you want to you wanna start maybe? A few words about, you know, uh, uh, who you are, where you are, um, and maybe a few words about your, your experience as an investor. You're, you're muted, uh, Joy. Hi, everyone. Good evening from Nairobi. My name is Joy Mubale. Um, I am calling from Nairobi, of course, the most beautiful city in the continent, um, without doubt. Um, my background is, um, I started out my career in software development. And I think uh, the lens with which I look at the world is, is, a, is a tech lens. Um, and uh, I moved into impact investing um, later on in my career, and I'm now in advisory. Um, I work with DFIs, I work with uh, SME impact funds uh, to advise them on uh, value creation, on um, development impact. Um, and then in my spare time, uh, I also provide pro bono advisory to uh, startup founders, uh, SME managers, and um, I also sometimes do angel investing. So thank you very much for inviting me to this forum. Thank you uh, for the work that you're doing to encourage angel investing across the continent. I think it's fantastic and much needed. Thanks. Thank you, Joy. Thanks for, uh, for joining us from Nairobi. Um, and um, we'll, we'll speak about that later, but you are um, um, uh, also known a little bit. You're a, a, a somewhat of a celebrity as being one of the first, if not the first, angel investor in a um, Kenyan um, agri-tech company called Twiga, which later uh, went on to raise substantially more capital. And that's a, it's a very interesting story that we want to, uh, you know, we look forward to hear, hear from you about. Okay. Um, a slightly closer to home, the one and only Danai. Thanks, David. It's really nice to be close to you, but far away at the same time. So I still haven't seen you in the flesh. Hi to everybody that's joining. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I'm Danai Musandu. Um, currently with a company and organization called HP Growth which is a tech uh, growth um, investment firm. Previously, uh, my experience was with an early stage um, investing in technology across uh, Africa. I sit on some advisory boards, one being Private Equity International, and also with the African Trust Group uh, that looks at investing predominantly at with, with women in Southern Africa. And uh, yeah, I'm really excited to explore this topic and to discuss it, really passionate about entrepreneurship in the continent um, and uh, the growth stage in which uh, we're seeing a lot of these businesses going through. So that's me in a nutshell and the rest you can always find somewhere online. 
Thank you, Danai. Always a pleasure to have you join uh, as a speaker. Uh, Keith? Thanks, uh, David. Yeah, Kid van Sale. I'm in one of the more ugly uh, cities in South Af in, in Africa called Cape Town, and um, and basically a, a, a an angel investor myself, basically an emancipated accountant. Um, but for the last 15 years or so, I've been very much um, involved in the venture capital investment space. We started our own business, Knife Capital, about 11 years ago, and yeah, we basically just hung in there for, 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 for life and managed to build a business in the process uh, that basically invests across the value chain on the earlier stages, on the seed investment sides. We, we really partner with angel investment investors. I don't think we've got any success story that, that hasn't involved a co-investment with an angel invest, investor. We've got an accelerator called Grindstone Accelerator. Uh, last week uh, or the week before launched also a women-led fund, which is led by my partner, Andrea Bowmit, Catherine Young, Rapalang, Rabana, um, involved in, in, in seed capital, seed investments in earlier stage businesses in South Africa and beyond. Um, our main business so far has been Series A, sort of the one to $2 million, one to $3 million range of investments, usually in follow on um, after Post Angel. And also recently, literally two weeks ago, launched a $50 million or first close of a $50 million Series B fund to take all these success stories further. So that's sort of across the value chain. But um, yeah, I think for purposes of today's discussion, just to see me as, as one of us, you know, I've got uh, a couple of my own personal uh, uh, angel investments through the years, but uh, it sometimes become, com become conflicting when you have to tell your VC partners why you are backing a company yourself and not via knife capital um you know sometimes that is becoming an issue thank you Keith. thanks again for uh, for joining us um so again the topic for today is exit um and um you know we're going to speak about you know what exits look like and uh, uh what, you know what should angels consider when thinking about their exit options what are maybe pitfalls for angels what are common mistakes angels make um, and um, we have, uh, like I said, a very sort of a nice mix of people as investors. And, and, and uh, Keith already mentioned he's an angel investor. He, of course, also is very much um, a VC investor. So he will uh, meet with angel investors when he comes in at a later stage. But I thought it would be interesting to start with um, the story of Joy, um, if you will allow me. Um, and just to introduce that again. So Joy is based out of Nairobi um, and has been involved as I think if I if it's correct that the, the first angel investor in a uh, Kenyan ag tech company called Twiga, um, which which later raised um, substantial rounds. Um, I, I lost track a little bit, but it's been you know one of the the local success stories, if you will. Um, and Joy um, sort of you know met with the company, joined them as an investor, and then also exited the company or sold their shares at some point. So I think that's a nice starting point for the conversation today, and then we can take it from there. Um, but Joy, maybe if I can ask you to, if you kind of walk us through your journey. So how did you meet the company? What was your sort of, um, you know, what were your considerations when you initially joined them? And also sort of what happened when you sort of, you know, when that point came, when you sold your shares, was that, you know, how was that? How did that come together? Thank you, David. Um, so... Just for context, I, I was not the only angel uh, in Twiga. There were there are several other angels, uh, Sebastian McKinley being one of them. Um, and my investment or my family's invest, investment uh, was syndicated. So uh, we had co-investors. Um, but when I came across Twiga, I was working for a Canadian impact, uh, impact fund manager um and um the minute i i was a portfolio manager with this impact fund and the minute i had um twiggers pitch it resonated so strongly with me um for those who don't know twigger foods um it's 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 a it's a kenyan company that aggregates demand in the last mile uh, from informal or micro retailers, um, and then uh, aggregates supply and supplies it to, to uh, informal retail. It also leverages technology to create efficiencies um, and has, has grown considerably um, over the last 
five years or so, um, we invested in Twiga in 2016, beginning of 2016. By then it was six months old. Um, what resonated uh, strongly with me were two things about Twiga Foods. One was that I, I have been a customer of uh, informal retailers. I know uh, how, how big they are, how much of the market of retail they have in Nairobi. Um, I think informal retail is estimated at billions of dollars uh, in, in Nairobi alone. So I, I, I've been a, a customer for, um, of informal retailers. So I immediately, the value proposition of the company immediately resonated with me. Um, my advice from this experience with Triga was that, um, you know, invest in what, what resonates, in what you understand. Um, if you hear about a business and you don't understand it, it doesn't mean don't invest in it. But uh, do some re research and, and see if you will understand uh, the business model, if it will make sense to you. Because if it doesn't make sense, um, then, you know, the, the risk of investing it in, is too high. So that was a very compelling thing. The second thing was um, Twiga had a great team. It had two co-founders, um, a young American called uh, Grant. Uh, Grant Brook and uh, a very successful Kenyan entrepreneur and manager called Peter Njonjo. Um, Peter had incredible skin in the game. Uh, he had invested $500,000 or so uh, into the company um, just, to, just to get a proof of concept. So this was, he had invested $500,000 before um, the seed round. So to me, the value proposition, um, the, the commitment of the team, the experience of the team were all very, very compelling. Um, and at the time when I first met them, I wanted my employer um, to invest in the company. Um, unfortunately, there was a little bit of resistance or maybe a lack of readiness. Um, and what I learned from that is that sometimes um, expert fund managers don't fully understand the market and what is compelling uh, in local markets and might not recognize promising ideas, promising businesses when they see them. Um, and a lot of people have, in Nairobi, there's been a robust discussion about uh, the fact that many local startups struggle to raise capital whereas expert founded businesses are very successful at it. I, I hear that point. I think there's a lot of evidence that supports that. Um, if you look at the data and there's been a lot of research and data that, uh, that, that you know, corroborates what um, this, this critique is. But I see that as a fantastic opportunity for uh, angel investors and, and local high net worths to get involved because if expert investors don't recognize opportunities, you are very fortunate to be here and to recognize those opportunities. So uh, back those ideas. And, and that's what I, I ultimately decided to do with Trigger. I spoke to my husband and said, this is such a great idea. I don't know why my employer is a bit hesitant to invest. And I said to him, look, if I can declare to my employer that you know, I, I would like to invest in this, um, I think we should put money into it because that's how compelling an idea it was. So in a way, I was an accidental angel investor. I didn't set out to be an angel investor. I sort of stumbled upon an opportunity that made me, made me to an angel investor. So um, yeah, I hope that's, that's sufficient. Over to you, David. No, thank you so much. That, that, that's a great story, of course. And I, I just double checked. So Twiga went on and has raised um, over 100 million uh, US so far, right? So it's really one of, one of Africa's success stories. Um, so before we move on, because I still want to try and get you to speak about the exit. So obviously, so you ended in 2015 and then you, you, you sold your shares in, in what year? 2019. 2019. And how, how did that come together? Was that like a, a natural progression because other investors came in or 
how what did what did you when who did you sell your shares to I me mean, what how did how did it go um that's that's a great question so um twiga looked promising and but many companies look promising when you first look at them uh i think the difference with them is that uh the the team was very and is very good at executing. Uh, I think they recently closed uh, a $50 million raise to allow them to scale across Africa. Um, so it, it, it really speaks to the brilliance of the team, the founding team, the management team, and the organization that they've been able to build. Uh, and because they were able to execute, um, subsequent rounds uh, drew a lot of interest. Um, so Series A uh, drew a lot of new investors, existing investors wanted to re-up uh, and just invest their pro rata share of, uh, of the company. Um, and, then, and then came Series B and the interest was, was even greater than it had been in Series A. Um, at Series B, I believe IFC came in um, and yeah, th there were a few other um, larger investors, more uh, bigger institutional investors. So when we saw that there was so much interest, we decided that we are very early stage um, investors. As angels, we've invested in businesses at idea stage. Uh, we've invested, <laughs> we've invested, you know, when, they're, when they have a bit of proof of concept, we've invested but we have never really invested at Series A. Series A is not our game. Um, so when we realized that, so we hadn't re-upped at Series A, uh, and then we were not going to re-up at Series B, uh, but there were new incoming investors that wanted uh, to buy our shares. Um, and we thought about it. Um, we believed very much in the company, but we also knew that the stages at which we can invest had passed. And we were now playing with the big boys and they could dilute us to smithereens. So we decided to take an earlier exit, uh, knowing fully well that the company would continue to thrive, would continue to grow. And if we waited a round or two, we could have made a higher return. Um, but we realized the risk of dilution. We also realized that the opportunity for a secondary shell, sale might not arise again. Um, so with those two considerations, we said, okay, fine, we are, we're gonna exit. And subsequent to, to that exit, we sold to um, a French high net worth, I think, high net worth investor. Um, I think they made their fortune in retail and they have a fund that invests I think maybe in um, scalable retail and subsequent to our exit a lot of my friends have laughed at me <laughs> they have said you are such a sucker you could have made 10x if you had just waited a year or two um, and I always say I don't really have any regrets I knew that Twigger would be successful that there would be opportunities to make you know even higher returns but there is there are different investors for different stages of, of a company um and you know when when the music stops for your stage of the company you have to recognize that and you have to be willing to move on and let somebody else uh come in and you leave some value on the table but you know such is life Sure. Thank, hey, thank you. you so much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for sharing your your, your story. Um, I think it's 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 very inspirational to all the um, angels and aspiring angels on the call. Um, talking about big boys, uh, Akit, any any reflections? Is this is this sort of a, a textbook story of um, how investing should go? Is this is this also what your experiences with investors or sorry with angel investors who obviously join an early stage and then move on when people like yourself um, and other big boys sort of come along. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say the, the big boys. Maybe just the in, in the more institutionalized capital. So I think, um, yeah. Thanks, Joy. Interesting story, and it is it is sort of typical. But I don't think one can ever 
um, well, well, you can regret it, I guess, over a, over a glass of wine in the evening. But but it's you know, there's a time to be an investor and there's a time to take money off the table. This is gambling 101, right? Um, and uh, you know, I think as one builds an early stage business, um, the entrepreneurs bootstrap typically someone believes in their dream, typically a mentor that says, okay, you know what, I'll put in a couple of hundred thousand dollars or, or, or whatever. And, um, and, you know, businesses evolve and they evolve by getting their, their cap tables quite um, messy. You know, so it's, it's quite, quite, quite messy for a VC to look at a cap table with 1% shareholder here and a 2% there and a 5% there. And ultimately, you know, our job as, as, as at least one of our jobs as a, as a VC investor is to get that business either to sustainability or exit ready. You know, so we put ourselves in the, in the eyes of a potential acquirer and, and the complications of different minority protections. And we've, we, I can definitely tell you, you, you some horror stories of, you know, cap tables and and agreements that don't have the right preemptive rights or follow on rights or, or where, where we literally, you know, and then maybe a, one example I can think of without na naming the company or anything is, um, you know, where this one angel investor had a, you know, 2% shareholding and obviously the acquirer wanted to buy 100% of the company and not 98% of the company and, you know, for some reason, you know, things weren't quite tied up and, and, and we had to literally pay that particular angel out more proportionally than what the 2% was worth, worth to sign the requisite, you know, warranties and those type of things, because it's all a bit of a game at that side. So is it typical? Yes, I think it is more and more happening. And I really think that's where the opportunity starts lying for, for angel investors, specifically as the VC market in Africa is, 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 is heating up, you know? So I think my first pearl, pearl of wisdom is to really understand the value of the underlying business, you know, and not, not hope that it might exit. There's a reason why there aren't many exits, right? There's many investments and it's all great in theory to raise series next, series next, series next, but that's unrealized returns. So it's, it's you, you know, it's, it's great to count your unrealized money um, because some unsuspecting venture capitalist overpaid for the business. But the problem is that then it becomes very difficult to exit that business, you know, because if you start sitting in the sell side due diligence with an M&A team, you know, they do look at the fundamentals and not at the, at the hype articles about how, how amazing African entrepreneurs are. They're like, okay, well, how does that translate into fundamentals and revenue and, and footprint and IP and technology? And, you know, these are highly experienced M&A you know, acquire, acquiring, you know, NASDAQ listed business businesses, you know, so they don't, they don't come and just, Oh, like, that's, that's an interesting pitch. Let me just, uh, let me just buy it for an overpay. So what I'm just trying to say is there is an opportunity to add this, like, I don't do series A or, or however you want to say it is, is to say, you know what, actually, you know, I've, I've invested X, my return profile is Y I've got a portfolio of investments. Some are safe, some are in stocks and bonds and properties, and um, and I th and this is a good time to take money off the table. A to cash in, B to enable the business to actually have successful raise because it, it's good to 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 clean up the cap table a little bit, and C to enable those entrepreneurs to to go on and raise further capital because sometimes it becomes too difficult for the VCs to to invest because of these issues are not taken care of at the beginning. And, and to be quite honest, businesses at the earlier stages have other priorities than to worry about formalizing their, um, you know, shells agreements and, and those type of things. So, yeah, I think it's, it is, it is typical and it is sometimes a good thing to, to exit, sometimes a good thing to, to hang in and come along for the ride, you know, and that, that is also a problem. You know, we, we currently have a transaction where one of the conditions is because we need to come for, for VC purposes we need to have a certain shareholding and reason to care knife capital always want more than 10 percent shareholding you know we don't it's it's not a mandate rule it's just a feeling you know we don't feel like we want six percent of of something you know so anyway to get there we have to take over to take out some secondaries in this particular transaction so we said look good news and bad news good news we'll, we'll give you the x million dollars of growth capital but we also need some people to to exit for a million dollars because we need to acquire some and 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 yeah and and now we're a bit stuck because the angels and everyone's saying no 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 hang on 
if knife's in, we want to come along for the ride. And we're like, well, there is no ride if someone, if, if, if we don't have some people falling on the exit sword. So, you know, um, it is a difficult game. Thank you, uh, thank you, Keith. And and before moving before moving to uh, deny one, one quick follow up question. So you mentioned that exits are still few. Is, is that why is that? Is it a complicated process? Are not enough investors? Why is it so hard to you know to to exit, if you will? Yeah, I think I think we mustn't confuse the excitement and and the hype of investing and investing at at fantastic. Um, valuations and, and you know every every day Maxime puts another graph out about how fantastic it is and that really is fantastic don't get me wrong but um, but investing is easy you know building businesses are as hard as, as it's ever been so so to, to build a business for three four five ten years to get to a point that one actually um, exits why are there so few exits relative to all the investment activity that's going on? Well, one part, one portion is over over overvaluation at the at the at the at the pyramid scheme of investing um, into into businesses. Um, this, but secondly, you know you have to really tee it up for for why would someone buy a business in in Africa? It is difficult um, from a regulatory perspective, exchange controls, um, ESG, um, you know, like cross border issues structuring where's the intellectual property structured is it a delaware co so we we do we, we do make it very complex and if a, if a company makes a strategic decision out of a headquarters somewhere and it could also be africa they have a reason for why they want to buy and if it's fintech it might be because they want a bigger footprint into emerging markets or they, or, or if it's a in their value chain, they want maybe a certain API switching mechanism. They want integrations with Mpesa or back end of, you know, into, into Yoko, whatever. Um, and, and one has to really figure out why would somebody buy you? And it's not for your revenue. And, and I think there's not a lot of thought process around teeing these businesses up for, 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 for the potential acquirer. And, and to be quite honest, in due diligence, there should already be a partner universe to say, well, who, who would I sell this business to? And then it becomes a three, four year journey to, to, to bump into these acquirers, whether you actively run a process or whether you just make sure that they become a client and, and understand your value proposition. So it really is a, a, a hard game. It just doesn't, you don't just, you can't just focus on building the business fundamentals. You also have to focus on the other side and bring these two things together. Thank you, thank you, and that that that's of course a very interesting uh, point as well in terms of what the role of investors can be or should be in terms of working with or guiding or coaching entrepreneurs to to get ready and to be ready for um, an exit moment. Um, Danai, maybe just also as part of the the further introduction. So 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 where do you sit in that sort of investment landscape? Where do you come in? Yeah, so I mean, it's 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 so interesting because uh, previously I would have come in at the VC stage, right? So where Keith is, and now I've moved a lot along that that road, which is the growth stage, right? And actually, what's quite interesting with what's happening in Africa now, yeah, the exits are definitely not as many, but it's the beginning. Is that growth is going to be the most important capital required in Africa next, and so everyone has always focused on the dearth of the early stage. Um, and that's why, you know, you would see the dynamics of new um, investors coming to the space more on the VC early stage. You saw your DFIs having more venture focused um, um, initiatives, uh, but growth is going to become the next uh, big question, which is how are you going to take these businesses to actually either, uh, do they have the ambition to become Pan-African or global? Uh, and that's that's a whole different mindset and a whole different thinking that's there. I think it's it's quite interesting. Um, just uh, pulling on what Keith and Joy uh, and Joy were saying, which is, uh, I believe, and and this has been from my from, from my experiences, is that uh, when you're investing, you decide to make that commitment. You should always have a, a horizon, the Northern Star, which is the thing that guides you. To your exit. And so what's quite interesting in the investment space is, is as Keita said, it is easy to invest, but value creation is actually the hardest part. And if you can create value in a business, 
and know exactly where your northern star is, that's that's your guiding light. So when you make an investment, you already need to know what your exit is going to be. Uh, that's that's uh, you know that's maybe it sounds quite morbid that you start making an investment so you already have a, an insight, a, an end date already. But that's actually typically how you should you should view it. Make the investment, but by the time by the moment you've made the investment, you should already have a horizon as as to when you're going to exit. What is also quite interesting, I think, within the exit space and the dynamic of Africa, what we're seeing is we're not going to see IPOs. That's for sure, because most markets can't handle that. Uh, and there's no infrastructure resource wise uh, and, and just in terms of uh, uh, functionality to be able to do that. You will see some mergers and acquisitions, and I think consolidation is going to be the most important game in Africa right now. Uh, consolidation between players, uh, which you've already begun to see a bit of that with uh, different uh, fintechs uh, consolidating with others. And that begs the question of, uh, you know, what is your role then as an angel investor in a climate that looks like that, right? Um, where you might have, yes, some VC players that are in there, but where you're going to have a strong consolidation game to really be able, as Keith was mentioning, justify the numbers for from an MA perspective when you have a lot larger players coming into play because when you do move into the growth stage it's about annual recurring revenue that's what you're now talking about it's about uh, is there profitability does this make sense and a lot of times a lot of these businesses um are profit uh, aren't profit making uh, uh, and and so how are you going to make a really good case uh, to have those really healthy exits um, I think that that's, yeah, just as a bit of like where my opinion falls within the spectrum. It's like a little bit of across the spectrum, I would say, David. No, thank you, Danai. It's, it's, um, I'm, I make, I mean, I have so many more questions for you, but that's, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll try to, to, to keep it, to condense it a little bit. But just, so one question, and maybe, maybe it's good to turn to Joy right away, because one question that comes to mind is obviously that, you know, there's a conversation about, uh, you know, having exits in mind and, 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 you know, but I guess my, my question is that, for example, in the case of Joy and Twiga, you know, you're, you're one of more angel investors. Um, the founding team is, is heavily invested themselves um, in a relatively short time frame. There is um, institutional investors. Um, so your role as an individual angel, um, what is what what can you do and and in this case um you know do, i mean is is your voice heard amongst the many voices and of course maybe twiga is different from other companies but um you know how much how much control over the ride do you have in that case um thank you that's that's a very good question um i think um because Investing at, uh, investing at seed stage is very different. The company is small. Uh, the number of investors is smaller. There is more contact uh, time with management and founders. So you do get your, your voice heard. Um, and I think at this stage is where, at the seed stage is where an angel investor can have the most influence. Um, Keith, Keith mentioned earlier that um, founders need to network, they need to see who they can sell to, they need to see who can be, uh, which institutional investors can come in at later rounds. Um, but at the same time, management is, is, is just overwhelmed with, uh, you know, building this business while they, they operate it. So I think that's where angels can come in and help to make introductions, um, look around the landscape and see who is a beneficial partner, a potential institutional investor, where is the good talent. Um, so I think that, you know, when you have a smaller company, even as a smaller investor, you, you actually create a lot of value. Um, we. We've had um, 
since 2016 to date, we've had a portfolio of, of, of um, six, six companies in which we've invested at seed stage. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'm quite sure that all those, the founders of all, all six, uh, six companies would say that we've, we've given them uh, support at the times when they really needed it. Um, so as an investor, you sort of want to, you want to give space to your, entre your entrepreneurs to, to, to create value, uh, but you also want to provide information and contact that will augment their own efforts, augment their own resources. They don't have all the time to speak to every investor. So you can do that. Um, so there's, there's a lot of value that, um, yeah, that, that, that angel investors can add at, at, at an early stage. But um, to, to Danai's point, um, I, I agree that the growth stage is vital, that uh, there is a lot of work to be done there. I, I still believe that, you know, venture stage in Africa is, is there's still tremendous opportunity there. Um, there is not enough capital. I believe there is not enough capital. I, and that's why angel investors are vital. Um, angels will understand value. You know, angels are not going to invest based on hype. At least I don't do that. I don't invest based on hype. If I don't see the value, I will not invest. So angels can recognize value. They can back these companies very early on before institutionals have the appetite, before institutionals can even see the value that these uh, companies can create. Yeah, can I just chime in there, David? Please, please. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I think, I think, I think sometimes the problem with the discussion is that we don't look at everything within a value chain because the reality is, is that for the Africa story to make sense, even for, for VCs to be able to raise funds, the big question from every institutional investor and most of the capital is actually coming from outside Africa. So that's, that's the reality of, of what we were, were living is, is the exit. It's the exit story because everyone wants to see some MIC that's there, an IIR. And I think that, yes, angel investors are vital. As, as they are vital, they can also be very detrimental too. There's always a two-edged sword that also comes with that because angels can also have a, what's this, a, a very larger stake because of the stage at which they come in uh, and quite a lot of influence and sometimes can also navigate businesses in, in the wrong direction or can be stubborn. Uh, so there's also a bit of that bias that can grow within angels that can that also has to be learned to be undone, but that happens when you diversify your portfolio um, and, and find a, a mechanism to strategize with your funding. But I think we have to look at it all within a value chain, which is, once again, like I said, what is the Northern Star? The Northern Star is that we want as much capital to be in Africa. And the reality is, is that for that to be a real realization globally, that there is something happening within Africa, we're going to have to really show realization, not only uh, what's on, on, on paper. And I think the jump between seed to series A, yeah, typically... You know, it's good for angels to be there and say, yeah, we've realized something. But I think the ambition is that those companies become even more. And to become even more, it means that we're going to have to attract the biggest boys in that space. And that should be the ambition. And that means the exit profile should be something that's thought of along a value chain. That every single moment is, a, is actually an exit moment in, a, in, in its rightful way in, in a sort of sense. And we have to have that ambition of how are we going to attract even more capital here, uh, even more sophisticated uh, uh, capital here. And unfortunately, we actually don't still, even with among angels, have enough Africans backing Africans. And that's, that's where we stand today, is most of the capital is not even from us. And that's, uh, you know, that's, that's a... That's a big thing. So, yeah. Thanks, uh, thanks, Danai. And 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 I mean, that's obviously also the the last that's the last point you, you make. That's also the raison d'être of the African Angel Academy, right? It's very much about um, Africans investing in Africa. 
Um, but, but just to go back to um, one point that you made, and I, I, I'd like to sort of bring uh, Keith into the conversation. So uh, Joy mentioned a number of so the, the things that, that angels can do in terms of um, you know, opening doors, network, um, trying to identify next investors. And you and I also mentioned that angels can also be detrimental to the company um, or, or pull the company in the wrong direction. Um, but uh, Keith, maybe for you also very specifically for this audience today of new and aspiring angels, what do you see as a sort of as a VC investor, as a follow-up investor on, um, you know, things that angels shouldn't have done or, or mistakes that are, that are made or things that you run into and that make your life difficult as an investor? You mentioned a few already, but almost in terms of advice to the, to the, to the, to the angels in terms of, you know, what, what are the sort of do's and don'ts? What are things you need to be aware of when you invest as an angel investor that will that might come back and haunt you at a later stage? Yeah, I think um, there's there's so much value that that angels add, and and also it's not always just because they need to run around and connect people and 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 do stuff and and sort of mentor the hell out of the entrepreneur. It's sometimes just being there, having been there at those earlier stages when no one else wanted to back that entrepreneur. And, and, you know, just to, to almost play, have played that um, sort of shoulder to cry on or psychologist type, type human role and, and put your money where your mouth is, that buys so much loyalty and trust that when, we, you know, I can I think of a few examples in our current portfolio, that just the mere fact that the angel is still in our monthly exco meetings, um, you know, obviously now a much more junior partner on the cap table because of dilution, because the VC came in. But just because it's almost like playing that translate that trust translator role be between the the new VC, which is running around, you know, with a portfolio of businesses, and 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 it is quite, um, you know, formulaic. I mean, you know, we want our monthly management accounts, and we we have our meeting, and obviously we'll be there when 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 there's this this trouble. But for the rest of it, you know, get on with it. To just continue being that sort of trust translator when, when, when there are other people in the room because of that three year, two year, whatever history that you have with the entrepreneur. So I think that's invaluable and doesn't actually, you don't think of the fact that actually I'm just adding a lot of value just by still being, being here and being involved and, and, and helping with, with, you know, just a, a, a kind of a sounding board for, for both the VC and the entrepreneur to, to talk to someone who's trusted in the, around the table. But in terms of, of what what not to do, you know, I think I think just just in terms of 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 how, and I think value chain is the right is the right word that 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 um, that you use there, don't I? Uh, it, it is really understanding. You know, there is obviously seed. You know, there's bridge rounds, there's safe rounds, there's there's Series A price rounds, and and then it goes on to growth. And 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 while we're talking exits, it's not. You know, we've we've had a few questions around should you or shouldn't you jump off at series A or not? Well, I mean, there is a time and it's based on your own investment thesis and portfolio. Remembering series A means, you know, even if you can high five each other about this amazing valuation you got, you got to remember that VC also now needs to get a 30% IRR or 10 times money or whatever. And that kicks that can five, seven, eight years down the track, which you now need to be in. And, and you're, you're, yeah, might get 10 times money, but 10 times money in three years, and 10 times money in 10 years, not the same thing um, in terms of the time value of money. So just think about, about, about that. But I think the things sort of not to do is, is and, and that's is really think about the instruments early on. You know, we've had some examples um, that, 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 that David knows about where, I mean, there's two companies right now. One, the entrepreneurs have 14% equity left. So they've, they've given 86% equity to a number of angels naively. Um, but, but still, you know, now I'm thinking that's even before my, so I'm, I'm just projecting the business based on the fact that the entrepreneur is going to have single figures and they promise me that they've got skin in the game and they feel, so we now negotiating with the angels to do a hell of a sort of reprice and clawback and staff incentive trust and everything like that. So we spend half the time negotiating with the angels to make sure that we all, for all our greater good. Um, have the entrepreneurs have more equity because as weird as it sound as us as investors we don't want as much equity as we can possibly get you know we, we want to make sure that the balance is right between the entrepreneur who's ultimately going to grow and and, and and be incentivized to grow that business and us 
sort of so safe agreements or convertible instruments, you know, at the earlier stage is, is, is better than a price round in many instances. You know, another example right now sitting, one angel put in relatively little money, took 40% of the business. I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but we now have two founders that have 30, 30% each and an angel that has 40. And that's, that's even at seed stage we're now investing in, and that it's like, sure. And, and another one where the angel has 70%. So, so it's, it's it just think about how that cap table needs to be constructed. And it's no, there's no shame in not knowing how to value these things. You know, so there's a very well-known um, angel in the South African environment and, and five years ago sat with me and said, listen, I'm going to give these guys a million rand, which is, you know, just under uh, so what $70,000 or so, whatever. And, um, but I don't know, do I take 10%? Do I take 70%? I, I'm just like, so, so there's, there's, there's just, you know, it must be as the minority stake or so, so. So that's kind of one of the things. And then, you know, entrepreneurs sometimes get desperate. So once there's 20, 30 people on the cap table, um, and there's some great examples of good businesses who have that, there comes a time to actually put all of that into an SPV or just, just, just get the rights, just, just clean it up. Because, um, you know, if, if follow on funders or even acquirers look at that, they just, they just you know, it's, it's, a, it's a massive red flag. Let me just put it that way. Very good. Thank um, you. And, and, yeah, uh, let very good. Um, just, just to add to what Keith said uh, and, and to really make it much, much simpler. Um, my advice to Android investors is don't be greedy. Don't be greedy. Don't try to shortchange the entrepreneur. If you shortchange the entrepreneur, you win nothing. You will get 80% of the company for $100,000 and the entrepreneur would not be <laughs> incentivized to do a good job, to build value. So you will have 80% of nothing. So always back the entrepreneur. Make sure the entrepreneur has a lot to win, a lot to gain. If you take up most of the company, you might as well just buy him out and go run the company yourself. You are not the entrepreneur. You are there to back the entrepreneur because once they win, so do you. So, you know, just make sure, make sure you advise the entrepreneur. There's a time where um, I, I think when COVID started, uh, we, we had a convertible note with an entrepreneur and we said, we're just going to suspend interest on this convertible note because this is a difficult time for business. And, you know, it's a difficult time for you. You need to focus on getting through it rather than worry about how much interest we are accruing on our convertible note. So, yeah, and some people thought I was stupid and they still think that. But it's fine. You just need to back your entrepreneurs. That's it. <laughs> very good. Very good. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we're uh, we're a bit overdue in terms of uh, allowing uh, the audience to uh, to ask uh, questions. Um, I'm just checking with Ayanda. Do people do we open up the mic or how do you want to, How do we do this? Yes, you can have um, people raise a hand and then we will just call on, on the hand. And if you don't want to kind of speak, you can drop your questions into the chat as you have been doing. And then we'll just keep track of them and, and make sure that the panel addresses it. Okay, very good. Are there any raised hands already at this time? Otherwise, I'll just continue from my side. But I'm very, very... Uh... I hope that we have some, I mean, uh, there's questions and then, then please, uh, you know, this is your, uh, your time to speak with some of the, you know, with some, some great investors. Otherwise, we'll just continue from my side. But is there anyone right now already, Ayanda? Nope, not at the moment. You can keep going. Okay, sure. Okay, I'll get going. So we, 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 t we touched about, we touched on this a little bit, but um, um, so obviously, uh, conversations about sort of investing with an exit in mind, um, some of the things that the investors, the, the role investors can play, um, but sort of more specifically in terms of what what is, you know, how can an angel investor, you know, how can you, how can you prepare for that exit? How do you, how does that work in, in real life? What do you have to do? Uh, I just, who wants to, wants to take okay. it? I, I can, may, I can maybe just kind of give, give the, 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 the cheat sheet. Um, 
I think don't be surprised if what in the process of building a business that a disruptive business that is amazing that someone's going to knock on the door and we alluded earlier it's not necessarily in the African context going to be an IPO even yeah I mean the Cape Town Stock Exchange and there's even the JSE and, and, and AIM I mean there's definitely SPACs and all sorts of interesting things that you find that's happening but um but anyway, so so you you kind of start disrupting or stealing a client here and there, or becoming specifically in the fintech value chain or insure tech, health tech, ed tech, um, and the the international dollar based buy, buyers are, are looking. I mean, if you if you're a business in let's say ed tech, in um, um, you know we've got one three ed tech businesses, and you know we've had inbound interest, my two favorite words next to each other as a, as, a, as a VC, when someone comes and asks you, look, is your business for sale or, or can you? And, and at that point, you know, you should really just be calm and collected. You should to look at your partner universe, to say, hmm, yeah, this is an interesting one, or I must put them on and see what vertical they come out of. Maybe they are, are you know, Indian based or US based, but just have that universe of you know, companies who are potential acquirers, potential competitors in the value chain, potential um, client, uh, that big clients, um, and and just sort of make sure that you track the, the 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 universe the whole time and the timing on the hype cycle. When that call comes, make sure that the proverbial two pager um, is absolutely updated and 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 you know, I mean, it's never going to be 100% updated, but 90% updated. That you just have to put in the latest sort of graph of. Of, of where the revenue is tracking without giving the secret source away, but just say, oh, it's actually not really, but I mean, here's a two page on the business, semi-confidentially, if you want more information, um, you know, give us a call. And then they give you a call. And then if, if something starts happening and they can say, listen, we are actually interested in, then make sure that you force them or potential people talking to the business not to actually waste the entrepreneur's time by doing an exploratory like what is going on in africa visit or worst case scenario competitive sort of just want to sniff around and, and and just say look and then it helps having a vc or an angel or someone who who is kind of a professional at this on the table say look what the process is we have a um, virtual data room available. So make sure you can kind of say that sentence. Um, and if one thing you could do is, is while the business is building, you know, if there's a marketing strategy, put it in the folder, make sure that one actually constantly builds a, 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 a data room while, while, you, while you're going, but, and you might have to run around in the last weekend before you open that data room, building the other 20% of it, but just make sure that you can say, look, we've got a data room available. However, we obviously can't open it to you guys unless we have a letter of intent or a term sheet or some indicative interest so we can see what your valuation card is that you're playing and um, and, and, and and make sure that, yeah, the marketing documentation is semi-updated, the data room is semi-updated, the partner universe is semi-updated, and then lastly, understanding of value. You know, valuation really is not complex. Even though it's difficult earlier, valuing an earlier stage business, it's just a glorified Excel spreadsheet with a DCF, a discount rate, a terminal value. I mean, like this is the basic stuff. The assumptions going into that financial model, okay, that's more complex. But just make sure you always don't, don't lie to yourself in terms of what is the actual valuation of the business. So if someone says to you, I mean, everything's always for sale, you know, think about it. My, my house is not for sale if someone knocks on my door today, but at some price, I'm I'm telling the kids to pack their stuff. We're going, you know. So um, so 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 we, we you, you need to sort of just make sure that, especially if you're playing the game with disruptive scale ups, that you that you play that game and you think about the end game. You know, you 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 really need to think about what what could happen there because, I mean, otherwise you're basically just a philanthropist locking in your money into a startup for because you want to give back and, and, and personal ego, which is also a strategy. But if you want to make money, you have to think about how to get your money back out. I was just going to add, which is, I think something that's important is psychology. So what is your psychology as an investor, an angel investor? And the second would be reference points. I, I, from my experiences with angel investors from the early uh, stage uh, space, is not having enough reference points. I think a good angel investor will always surround themselves by the next investor they wish to sell to. 
and that they will always be having those conversations with the institutions that would typically be looking um, at those businesses. I think it's also about having a curious mind and always knowing that you will not know as much as others will know and what can you also learn. Uh, so the psychology of not having an ego that just because you're an investor, you seem to know more than the others around you. I think having a curious mind as to what you can learn for others is going to be really important. And the third one around valuation, because Keith has mentioned it, is don't, don't make an exit a valuation be based on what you want to see on on the paper as as the exit that you want to see a valuation has to make sense for a company for the future will it be able to reach that target or will it suffer a down round later onwards because you're stubborn about a particular price today and so are you short-sighted so i would just add that um, on some of the things that are important very good. Thank you so much. Thank you. I see, I see Joy, a couple of questions. I'm sorry, I saw Joy's mouse moving. <laughs> thank you. Thank right. you very please, much, please Danai. Um, I see Danai is, uh, sorry, Ayanda is going to read some questions. Um, but I, I wanted to add something to the question you asked earlier. How can angels help um, founders and managers to prepare for exits? Um, and there is more than just IPOs um, as ways to exit or secondary sales. You could also have a strategic acquisition uh, by a company in your industry. So I think angels need to continually help their um, entrepreneurial teams to focus on where the value of the company is and how that could be valuable to, 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 to strategic buyers. So you know, some, some companies are looking for, some strategic buyers are looking for interesting products. Um, you know, Facebook bought Instagram because Instagram was a really interesting product. Uh, Instagram, I think, didn't IPO. They might have, but I don't think they did. Uh, they were simply acquired because they were a strategic fit. Um, back here in Kenya, um, the French company Rubis Oil acquired Ken Cobble, uh, a local oil marketer. So, you know, instead of Rubis Oil coming into Kenya and building a network of stations, they came in and acquired a local company that already had the infrastructure, uh, the distribution and marketing, and, you know, HR infrastructure. So, you know, it's, it's really important to focus on where is the value of this company? Is it in the widgets? Is it in the people? Is it in um, you know, it's, it's, it's distribution network. Um, that's, that's something that, um, we try to do. My husband and I, we are partners. We try to ensure that in our regular discussions with founders and managers, we try to focus on, you know, where is the value? How are you better than the competition? What differentiates you from the competition? Thank you. Thank you, Joy. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I see a number of questions in the in the chat, uh, all, all very good and relevant. I'm just trying to see if I can challenge someone to to, to speak up. We have um, Anthony. You want to maybe ask the question, or do you want me to start out? No, that's fine. Yeah, thanks, uh, David. Um, so uh, my question was basically uh, speaking with a lot of international investors. I'm based in the UK here. Um, have you guys had much experience working with new international investors entering the African continent? And if so, what are some of the key challenges you might have seen, both from the perspective of the international investor struggling to say, you talked about the cap table challenges. I know it's, it's come up a lot with international investors seeing cap tables that don't look too good. But equally as well, what are some of the issues that international investors bring to the table where they're not as helpful to the founders or local investors? So I guess biggest challenge for international investors coming along with its challenge for them or challenge they might be bringing and what are the kind of solutions you see that help them better navigate uh, investments on the continent thank you I'm happy um, to uh, yeah you, uh, you, no you can go for it i'll, I'll add <laughs> i think i think the biggest issue is um reference points uh and 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 i have just seen it time and time again which is 
you know, it's not a safari dream. And sometimes there's a, <laughs> sometimes there's an inability to 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 really have a, a local understanding and know-how and knowledge. And I think that that's crucial. I think for international investors coming in, they need to partner with the right people. Uh, they need to also be there. They need to smell it, feel it, dream it, eat it. They need to really understand when we say a company needs to pivot now, it needs to pivot now. They need to understand if the government tomorrow decides to wake up and say, we're changing this whole machine, they changing the machine. And how do you react to that? And so it's that reference point of, typically your reference point would be, you know, from an international perspective where investments are, are, are done differently, uh, trying to apply that in a lens where it might not be applicable. So I think it's reference points and, and also just having the curiosity to learn. Um, but what's also good is that international capital also does come with a little bit more firepower. If you're looking just from an exchange rate perspective, um, they're coming with a lot more money um, in the bank. But the other thing that's also detrimental is that a lot of international capital has also been what has been the cause of the increase of valuations that you've been seeing in the continent as well. Um, so not buying at the right price. And that comes with reference points, curiosity, understanding of the market as well, and applying a different reference point. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Danai. Uh, Anthony, was that helpful? Yes, super helpful. And that last point, particularly around kind of valuations and how they're assessing it from an economics or an investment thesis standpoint. And I think someone mentioned it, are the valuations on the continent being so high right now a, a good thing or is it kind of a false representation because of international or global influence? So, uh, yeah, I think it's a good point that's been touched on. Thank you. Yeah, I think if I can maybe also just add about, you know, Africa is a bit of a, an interesting series of countries in, a, in, in one continent, but there's, there's a, quite a lot of interesting things around regulation and, you know, exchange rates and constraints controls. And there's, there's quite a lot of complexity that one wouldn't ordinarily think of in, in, an, in, a, in a developed market, you know. So with that complexity becomes, comes opportunity. So that's fantastic for all of us to have this complexity. But just to have some understanding around that is, is, uh, is, is, is critical. Um, to, to add to that, um, one of the, it's true that international capital has really distorted valuations um, in Nairobi, maybe five years ago, um, you know, a pre-seed valuation would be like a million dollars, maybe $2 million. And now pre-seed is $10 million for a company that is less than a year old, um, which is, you know, significant um so th there has been some distortion but that's really something for entrepreneurs to manage um the, if you create high value expectations then you have to live up to them as as Danai said earlier uh, but the other thing i think that um internationals experience um is they come in with a very procedural approach uh, and they extend, they have very tight timelines. They want everything to close yesterday. Um, but you're dealing with entrepreneurs who, you know, are, are, are raising for the first time or are dealing with institutional investors for the first time. So I think it's important to um, add some slack into your system to also expect that you might have to educate your entrepreneurs on, on what your expectations are uh, and, and, and to educate them so that you can be aligned. So it's not all procedural. Um, there, is, there is some learning to be done on all sides. So um, your timelines need to be a bit more flexible. Um, and uh, yes, really keep your ears to the ground. Africa is a uh, large and complex continent. Um, I have seen uh, South African investors come to, to Kenya many times and, and, you know, just make so many mistakes. <laughs> uh, even though they're Africans, they are still running into trouble. Um, so yeah, just take time to learn the markets, to educate yourself, to understand the dynamics before you um, rush in. I just, I, sorry, David, I just wanted to say- Go ahead. What's an interesting dynamic 
uh, interestingly enough, Anthony, and your point is, is that you're actually, you're finding now a lot of African startups moving <laughs> to, to Europe and the USA. Um, so just on the point of, of capital, I must also just add, high valuations is actually not just Africa suffering from it. Yeah, I'm actually, you're seeing it in the growth uh, stage as well within a European and US context because there's just way too much money right now. It is a hot market everywhere. So that's just, that. I just also want to add that context. Um, but also to add as well, you also see a lot of migration. Currently now there's a trend of a lot of businesses leaving Africa that are African businesses and wanting to be closer to that money. So which also begs the question again, uh, you know, we don't have enough uh, capital within Africa as well. That's at least allowing these businesses to stay within Africa. Yeah, yeah but look, yeah. just on, on that, I think that's a massive advantage of international investors coming in because you have directors that can sit outside of common monetary areas. You have soft landings for internationalization. You can, you can register your IP in Delaware, Luxembourg, London, you know, Amsterdam easier. So, so which makes the exits easier again. So the structuring of the deal, because, you know, people want to buy or institutions want to buy back African entrepreneurs, but it's much safer backing that via Delaware C Corp and then backing it via a PTY limited in South Africa that needs reserve bank approval every time they want to send one rand outside of the country, you know, so. So I think there's a lot of benefit of, of mixing it up with international investors, lots more local investors needed from an angel perspective. But um, yeah, I think it's not us versus them. I think it's a, it's a fantastic collaboration. Brilliant, thank you guys, that's super insightful. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll make sure other people get questions in now. So yeah, thank you again for your time guys. It's been a really great session. Thanks David for letting me come up. Sure, thanks. Um, anyone else who wants to raise their question. I see questions from Yvonne and questions from uh, Pitsy. Maybe it's a dress, I'm not sure, but you know, please, uh, if you wanna, if you wanna you know, speak up, then you know, you're, you're very welcome. Hey guys, Sorry. can I follow up with uh, Keith on something? It's Raj. Right, sure. of course. Raj, how are you, man? Course. Nice to see you. I'm good. I've been, I've been, I've been dual tasking, working and listening to you. Very interesting conversation. Thank you very much. Um, listen, Keith, I, I want to ask you a question, especially on South African context. Right. So, are you saying that you, as a South African VC, uh, even you are advising South African uh, startups to incorporate in Delaware? I mean, I think I'm finding this all the time. So we just. I think, I think we both are in the same, same business and I'll, we can talk about that in a minute. Where I said, look, I want you to go set up a C Corp because it's just too difficult investing in a South African company. Are you saying that for all your investments? And is, is, is Delaware C Corp the only place you're telling them to go or what else are you doing? No, so, so well, first answer, unfortunately, yes. I mean, we, we're short of making it a condition to our investment. Every single knife capital business is either structured offshore or has a strategy to, and a timeline to be structured offshore. Um, where it depends a little bit about where we see the likely exit universe to be, you know. So, 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 so it isn't unfortunately there's no one answer. It also depends a little bit about the entrepreneurs whether they're willing to move for a few years or or, or whatever. But um, you know, we we see you know, our portfolio is scattered across. Luxembourg, Amsterdam, UK, and Delaware for, for various different reasons, you know. And Knife Capital ourselves is, is basically structured in Jersey, our GP partnerships and all the rest of it, you know. So basically, probably shouldn't say it being a South African VC, but anywhere but South Africa, to be quite <laughs> honest. I've had, a, well, okay. I've, I've, had enough, I've had enough fights with the Reserve Bank. So the problem is, and, and I mean, like I can use our Garmin, um, we had a, a startup exit to Garmin and basically how it works here is, and that was a PTY limited in South Africa and, 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 and the, the Garmin lawyers looked at us and said, so, so what you're telling me, and that was when Zuma was president, that we can do our whole due diligence and, and, and then we must take all our legal documents and send that to your government, your reserve bank. And they can then say yes or no, and it takes eight weeks. So can't they tell us now whether they'll approve the deal before I waste our time on a DD cost? We'll just buy some other radar startup in the world. 
And we're like, no, 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 don't worry. They kind of say yes. And we've got our contacts there. And, and, and they said, geez, like, well, just, just, just let me just run this by us one more time. So, so, so you kind of scare away potential exit acquirers by having to explain to them that we need permission to, to send IP and, and, and money out of the country to an international acquirer. They, they can say, in theory, they, they, the, the government can say no. You know, so they don't, but now try and explain this on risk to a potential acquirer. So, yeah. So I think, I think that's sort of consistent with what my conversation with the founder, and I think we're both, I can't recall which part of your, um, I know you've got lots of different hats now, Keith, but I think we're both in uh, Wello, right? So I, I, the first thing I said to her, the founder was, I can't invest in a South African entity. I mean, just impossible. Um, and so I think that's what we sort of persuaded her to, to, to change. So I'm glad that we're on the same, on the same page on that. I think the other thing yeah. I would say, I would say. Sorry, that, just, a, just a quick question, comment. The tax treatment and the IP treatment, unfortunately, are sometimes in contradiction to each other. Like you can make, you can make it, make it easy, but it's just, it's just so much easier. The problem is just as expensive, you know, so right. as an angel investor early on, the question is not if you should do it. The question is just when you should do it. And the answer right. is always as soon as possible. But practically, do you go hunt clients with the sales strategy or do you go pay money on an offshore structure? Like it's just, it's, yeah, it's, such a, it's just the timing and because the, and the, it is, however you cut, cut, cut this cookie, it's expensive, but it does help yep. in the end. You know, like, like that Order Talk exit that I posted earlier, it was Order Talk Inc., Delaware business. Uber Eats, easiest due diligence in the world. They, they bought a Delaware C Corp and they were happy. They didn't have to worry about South Africa. You know, we had to worry about the tax treatment of that money coming back in here and all the rest of it. But that wasn't, that wasn't the exit, the, exit, uh, the choirist problem. And that's what we want to make. Just make it damn easy for investors like yourself or other angels in the US or UK or whatever to invest here and make it easy for setting up these businesses for exits. And that unfortunately is, until we abolish exchange controls, that is the answer. But Steve, can I just, sorry, I don't want to drag on, but just one more question, question and comment. So I think the, the other issue we talked about, you mentioned briefly is IP, right? So the longer you keep the IP in South Africa, the more difficult it is to transfer it without, without incurring charges, right? So it's kind of a balance between the two, right? Am I getting that right? Yeah, so I think the, the short IP lesson is any IP that's been created here, leave it here. <laughs> um, and the other th theory is version 2.0 and 3.0, you build on outside of the country and, 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 and contract the local right. developers right. in. And, and, and remember that software generally dies every three years, you know, new version, old version, you know, like what I'm just saying. So right, right off the... Right. Don't don't try and move it um, unless you can acquire it all out. But um, okay, like, that's, like, okay. So so the, throw the IP under the bus that's here for three years, and, and okay. version two point that you develop in London or ever is building on top of that. Yeah. Okay. I, I hope you told that to um, uh, our, our mutual uh, um, portfolio company. Thank you, Raj. Thanks for. Uh... Thanks for, for joining us and, and coming in. Very important point, of course. And thanks, Keith, for your uh, also for your you know your your words of wisdom and your 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 candid feedback. Um, we are about to close this session, and um, I want to sort of you know compliment, thank of course our speakers, also compliment you for your ability to keep you know with a hundred or you know close to a hundred people sort of glued to the screen for uh, for an hour and a half, which is uh, you know, which is a you know an attention span that we don't see uh, that often. Um, I'm looking at Ayanda and Alex. If there's any sort of closing remarks, parting words, any final words of wisdom before I ask the the panelists for maybe a, a final word. Maybe we do it around. Maybe I'll ask Keith and Danai and Joy just from your side if there's any sort of last takeaway if you, anything you want the audience to you know to to remember or take away from from the session and then you know speaking about exit is there any kind of either advice or or, or, or lesson you learned over the years that you want to sort of uh, stress before we uh, before we close the session uh joy maybe start with you thank you thank you david um i would like to do to say two things um one is um 
to follow on something that Danai said earlier, which is that um, there are few African angels that are investing in um, African ventures. Um, and I, I think I've become something of uh, an angel investing um, activist. Um, and I just, I, I want to tell everyone on this call that who I think are Gen Xers, millennials, and maybe some Gen Zers, that um, at the moment, many of us who have capital to invest are still investing in the very same things our grandparents invested in. We are investing in real estate. We are investing in public equities. We are investing in everything that is safe, but everything that has been there for a very long time. The landscape has changed. There are new emerging opportunities and many of us are sitting on the sidelines. And at some point we shall start to complain that some people are benefiting from investing in African startups and we are not. So I, I would like to encourage everyone, please get off the fence. You don't have to invest 100% of your equity in startups and growth stage businesses, but take some risk. It might be 10% of your equity. It might be 5%, but this is an asset class that has real potential. You will see from all the case studies that are being showcased uh, in, in, in this platform that there is potential in new emerging disruptive business models on the continent. Take your time, think about it, do your research, but take some risks because capital at venture stage is still very scarce. Institutionals and international investors are afraid of them. So we need to see what works in these markets and we need to take a, a chance on them. Um, the second thing um, is also to follow on to something that Kit and, and, and Danai said. I think Kit wrote something in the chat about exits and, and building value. Yes, you want to exit as an angel investor, but the best way to exit is to focus most of your energy, your perspiration, 90% of it, on supporting value creation in the business and spend time, like 5%, thinking about your exit options. Because if you build a beautiful business that can scale or that spins off cash, there will be exit opportunities. So. The, the, the opportunity is in the value creation. That's it for me. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much, Joy. Very excellent, excellent uh, uh, way to, to sort of to finish the session. Um, Danai? Sorry. Shortly for me, start with what you know. Uh, start with what you know. So the thing that interests you, whether it's hair, agri, whether it's um, toilet seats, I don't know what you fancy. Start with what you know, start there and always ask you, yourself, what value can I add? So I think start from the perspective of not what can I get out, but what value can I add? And the second and last thing is remain curious. Always be curious because trust me, you don't know any better. And so if you remain curious, you will make really, really good investments and bad ones, but don't let the bad ones also disappoint you too much that you don't keep taking the risks. So remain curious, I would say that. Those are my two things. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, Danai. Um, Keith just dropped off the call, but I'm not sure if you're back with us again, Keith. Yeah, I can give you, hopefully, if you can hear me, three pearls of wisdom. Otherwise, you can conclude for me. But I would say just number one, have a portfolio approach. You know, this is investment 101 and in a, in a risk portfolio, you need to diversify. So if you're only going to pick one or two angel investments to do, rather co-invest with other angels in, in, in more um, because spread the risk. I think the second thing when it comes to, to specifically to, to exits is to, to really start the process already in the due diligence. You know, 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 how, um, know, know how this movie could play out you know do a do a pre-mortem do it you know like on the business like what could go wrong 
um, and what could go right and and just just own that and then just yeah I, I think the the fundamentals of um, of of understanding your own thesis you know you almost have to have a little mandate certain things you must just say no to because they're outside of your mandate personal mandate and other things are squarely what you look for and then associate yourself and go to networking events and co-invest with with other angels and VCs and stuff that that have the same ethos because then you can you, you know you can actually add more value because it's either in your network or in your passion zone okay very good thank you so much um, I think we're, um, we're we're done from our side I want to hand it back to uh, Sorry, David. Yeah, I want to hand it back to Alexandra for, for the, the, the closing wrap-up, the final wrap-up. Thanks, David. Thank you so much to our speakers and thank you so much to David for hosting. Um, I'm going to be super quick because I know that it's everyone's evening. Thank you so much for attending. There are three things that we, four things that we'd like to remind you of. The first is that we are still open for applications. So if you would like to learn more um, about the African Angel Academy, please visit our website and you can follow the links to sign up for the next uh, cohort, which begins in January. Then we also have some fantastic case studies. So if you are wanting to learn more about Joy and her Twigger journey, please visit our website, look at the resources section, and there is a great um, case study on Twigger Foods. We also have one on Paystack, and we have one on Sweep South, and hopefully we will have some more case studies uh, coming soon. Then the other thing is that uh, for those angels um, who are looking at investments currently, we are running uh, applications for our showcase event at the end of, of January. So if you've got a portfolio company who's looking to raise additional capital or you are wanting to partner with other angels, we're looking for five startups from South Africa, five from Nigeria and five from Kenya. So please send in your recommendations there. There's a there's an application form. It should have been in your uh, email you received on Monday. Otherwise, just contact Ayanda. And then the other thing.